Hey, everybody, this is Josh Lindsay from the American Business Broker Podcast, the show that gives you full access to successful business owners and what it takes to sell a business. We break down the deals, give you full access to the owners, and as always, I share my secrets to selling a company. Enough talk. Let's go. This is episode three. Uh, I'm with a friend and former client, Travis Ashby. Travis, what's up? Hey, how's it going? Things are good. Thanks for coming down. I know it's early, but the studio gets busy, so I appreciate you coming down here at 8.30 a.m. Anyways, um, so Travis, man, it's been so long. I swear it was 2014, right? Yeah, 2014. When you guys sold, Oozle Media was the business. Um, And I know you've been off doing a million things. Um, One thing that I have noticed so much about you is you are like the quintessential entrepreneur. Like I've told people this. I've never met anybody like you that has so many good ideas. Like, dude, you're just a guy that has a million ideas. You know that. You know You know that you're always like... Blessing and a curse. Well, blessing and a curse. But like, when I categorize what an entrepreneur is, like, I see you in the dictionary with your face just because it's somebody who just, you've always got a great idea for the next great idea for the next great idea. And I will kind of jump into that. Um, but like... That's just who you are to me. It's like you're just this guy that's just always thinking bigger, always thinking about the next great business that you can launch, how you can launch it. And I just, for me, that's what an entre- a true entrepreneur is. I wouldn't categorize myself as on- an entrepreneur. I'm more of a guy of take a jug, stick it in the river of money, and like fill my jug up, so to speak. But like, dude, you're you're a pioneer. Like, you just are one of those guys that just has all these good ideas. So I'm excited to have you on the podcast because I know – you just have such a unique perspective on on business. So I appreciate you coming down. Yeah, no, of course. Glad to be here. Really so um, like I talked earlier, um, Oozle Media was the company that, that I represented and sold for you. So let, let's just start by kind of giving the listeners some backstory. Um, maybe start off telling us who you are. Maybe tell the Yellow Pages story, yeah. that type of stuff. And then kind of how you transition into starting Oozle Media with your partner, Scott. Yeah, for sure. You know, I never started off to be an entrepreneur. I'd worked for Fortune 500 companies like, Coke and Pepsi yeah. and, then, and then Verizon. Yeah. And uh, in the early 2000s, Verizon had uh, Yellow Pages, believe it or not. It's so weird to think about. So weird, right? right? It's forever ago. Yeah, like Yellow Page directory. And and so, you know, I had just graduated from from Westminster and kind of in market with a marketing degree. And I and uh, I was, had been working at Pepsi for a while and just wanted to kind of get into advertising sales. Right. And so I ended up kind of finding my way at, uh, at Verizon. And they had an online directory called superpages.com. And it just started? Yeah, it was pretty new. I mean, this was early 2000s, so Google hadn't really hit the scene too hard. Okay. And so, so uh, they had their own directory. They had their own yellow page Super directory. Page. Superpages.com. Super page. Yeah, Love so it. they competed with a company called Dex and okay. a few other ones. And so I got a job there and uh, yeah, I loved it. I, you know, it's mostly commission job. It was my first time I'd gone from like relationship selling. How and, like, old were you? I was, I don't know, early 20s. Okay, 24, 25. Yeah, yeah, something okay. like that. All right. Yeah, something like that. You break off. Break off. 100% commission? It was like close. 25% base, 75% commission, okay. you know. All upside. Yeah, and so just kind of got my first like commission mostly job and yeah. and, and hardcore selling type job. And, right. and it was awesome. Like, I loved it. How did you sell? How did I sell? Yeah, meaning like, were you knocking doors? I mean, oh, kinda, yeah, kinda yeah. Back in the day, so what were you doing? Yeah, it, I mean, it was B2B, selling to small, medium-sized business owners, right? So knocking on doors? Yeah, carpet cleaners to like just brick and mortar type stores. Yeah, knocking doors, cold calling. Just cold, Just like, yeah, up. they gave us these yellow sheets and we would just call and... And, uh, and then go out and, just, and meet with them? Yeah, try to get past con- gatekeepers and right. just try to like go hardcore, just meet people. And, nice. And so that's what we were doing. And, uh, you know, I did that for a few years. And, you know, when the economy kind of started to crash, so fast eight-ish? forward like three, four years later. Okay. Yeah. So this is like actually 07. Okay. Economy is kind of crashing. Small business owners were going out of business. Things were getting a little hairy. Okay. And uh, I remember walking into this appointment one day. It was a, the heating and air guy. And I remember the guy, our competitor just left. And it was the Dex guy. He had just left. And I walk in and I thought for sure he was canceling mm. with us mm. because they had a better product than we did Dex in this market okay. in, in the Salt Lake market. And so I sit down with this guy and he's, and he, and he ends up telling me, Hey, I had to cut all my marketing and I'm just waiting for the blow. Right. And, and he's like, but I decided to go with you guys and uh, this money mailer over here. And so I was like, well, I was really surprised by that. And, and, and I said, well, how did you, how did you come up with that decision? He's like, I hate working with that guy. I'm like, really? the, the guy that just left. He's really? like, yeah, I hate working with that guy. Really? Like, he's like, I, you know, he's like, so you so you want to do business with me just cause you like me better than you like that guy. 
And he's like, well, yeah, I just trust that you're not going to sell me something that's not going to work for me. Interesting. And, and he went on to say that like, if this doesn't work for me, I'm going out of business. Like I, I, I narrowed everything down to two things of, of advertising. Yeah. A lot man. of pressure. So all of a sudden I just realized, like it just hit me like, I can't sell something I don't believe in. Oh, and, uh, and, and I just, you know, felt like I, I can't sell this. So I went back to the office. I found the other top sales guy, a guy named Scott Linford. Yeah. We were always like had a friendly competition. We were super competitive guys. And, and, uh, I just said, we need to start our own business. And he's like, really? well, what are we going to do? I'm like, I have, <laughs> I have no idea. Let's figure it out. So we literally got like on the computer and just started looking up like franchises and trying to figure just it whatever. out. Just whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and we both just kind of felt like what we were selling just wasn't going to work, mm. you know, that mm -hmm. well. And so we ended up, uh, just kind of trying to sleep on it. And then he came in the next morning. He's like, I know what we're going to do. I'm like, well, what is it? He's like, call tracking. We're going to do call tracking. Like, well, what do you mean? He's like, you know how we put call tracking numbers in everybody's ads and then like tracks the number and like you're able to kind of figure out what, what actually works. Well, I found like a call tracking provider that actually records the calls. And back then in early two thousands, that wasn't a thing like mm -hmm. recording the mm -hmm. calls and stuff. Mm -hmm. So anyways, we just, we said, look, let's go to companies and say, look, we're going to put tracking numbers in all your advertising. We're going to figure out what works, figure out what doesn't streamline it, know the difference between it all, get rid of the stuff that doesn't do more of the stuff that does and, and, and help these business owners like figure it out. And we're not like attached to any marketing at the, at the time. So we, we just figured out like we can just be honest with them and just so tell them. That was the foundation. That was Uzzle? the foundation of Oozle Media. Of Oozle. Yeah. Call track. Call tracking. That's bananas. Yeah. Third, That's like a very third party call product. tracking platform. That's how you started. There That's, was really no tech, no SEO behind it. There was it none was of that. Like, we just were a reseller of this other company's tech and, um, and it, we just crushed it. Like it, when the economy was just turning down and things were going People so bad. needed to yeah. dial in. Yeah, I went home one day and told my wife, hey honey, I'm gonna actually quit my job or starting a business. <laughs> so I'm leaving a six figure job. Yeah. First house just bought, first uh, kid on the way, uh, economy's crashing all around us. And hey, what a great time to go start our own business. Did I mention that Travis is an <laughs> entrepreneur? That's what I mean though, man. Like you just are like, hey, self-belief. Yeah. Like you've never seen. Yeah. So, you know, the thing that I think that we believe though, is we knew that it would help people. And so these business owners were like, oh my gosh, I can actually like know what works. Like that, was, is, that was, that was innovative at the time. Yeah. So now this heating and air guy, for example, first customer, like he just, he, he was like, he got 10 calls from advertising, went and listened to them, found out that three of them, you know, were good deals. And two of them, he, he made X amount of dollars, you he know, could dial for every in dollar he put in, he got this much back from this advertising back. for every dollar he put into this one. He got this much back. He broke even here and he lost money on these three, got rid of it and then, and then help business owners out. So that was kind of the, the origin story. So just to backtrack a little bit though, like, so when you start at Oozle media, obviously self-funded, self-funded, yeah. Like how much? Yeah. So like we actually had a little bit of overlap with, uh, super pages. So we ended up you know, I'd go on a sales call and, and they weren't really doing like making any money on call tracking numbers. Right. And so like, right. I would just refer Scott and then he would go in. And so we right. had, you know, I, I'm all about, like, I think the best entrepreneurs are risk mitigators. They're not really risk takers. Like I think the smartest, you know, entrepreneurs like find out, like you don't want to put your whole family, create a bridge. Yeah. Create and a bridge, be smart ready. about yeah, it. Right. Like don't put everything on the line yeah. and jeopardize Caution your family. To the wind, so to Caution speak. to the wind. And yeah. so we actually had some overlap of, of being able to build up customers and so figure were, out that it worked. That's how you were self-funding. That's still how we were. A little bit of work, still a yes. little bit of commissions, kind of creating and that the side hustle. Yeah. yeah it was, fine. it was a side hustle fine. thing, you know? And so we yeah. did, we did that and, and we were still the top two sellers at how long did it take the other company? for the bridge so, to be built? Six months. Okay. So six months, once yeah. you had, you know, a dozen plus clients, you were like, Hey, this is going to work. The yeah. results were proving themselves. Resu results were proving themselves. It. Yeah. You were like, let's go full time. Yeah. Let's go for it full time. So we just took that leap. So the and two of you, that was it. That was it. Foundation just of the bootstrapped. Company. Yeah. And, and we made six figures in our first years in the, in the awesome. economy in downturn. Oh, eight, oh, nine. Oh, eight, oh, nine. Yeah. It was crazy. So it's interesting, but un I mean, like so many other successful business owners, what you identified was a need. Yes. And the need was, you know, pre 07, it was kind of a pay and pray mentality mm -hmm. where you would pay money for advertising and pray that it worked. Yep. And you identified a need to identify what worked. Right. And I know that's commonplace now with all the analytics that yep. we have. But in 07, like if you weren't in the game selling, pay and pray really was a term. Yeah. You know, you'd run an infomercial and you would pray that that thing would work. Yeah. Or a radio ad or whatever it was. And so you just, you kind of honed in on that need early. Yeah. And built upon it. Yeah. And, yeah. and what we ended up finding was as we analyzed all the data, because we were getting a lot of data, we found that the best ROI was internet marketing done yourself. Okay. So that transition. That's the transition. Right into my next, my yeah. next comment, which is how did you grow your business? So you start out with the call yeah. platform mm -hmm. and then you grew it into. 
Yeah. I mean, we would look at the ROI and we're like, man, if, if people just do their own Google AdWords, like they're crushing it. Right. Like ROI is ridiculous. So we had what's called dynamic number insertion. So if you put, uh, if you had your website and someone came to Google and was looking at plumbers in Utah, they would go to your website. Well, a, a unique number would surface on the website. And so we knew that that call or that recording of that call came from this keyword. You know, clearly if they typed in plumbers, Utah, they didn't know who they're going to go with. Right. Right. And so we were able to like do a lot of that kind of tracking because of the reseller that we were part right. of the, te- right, right, right. the tech company we were okay. reselling. So here, here you are. You, you've, you've established a good foundation that you can provide real value to business owners. How did you grow your business? So what products did you bring in to Oozel Media on top of the call tracking? Like, what did you start? Yeah, so we started start off doing? with just Google AdWords. So we were Google AdWords managers, okay. and we had call tracking. Did you go through training for that, or what did yeah, you do? Yeah, just they had kind of just the online training, so we just kind of went and figured it out ourselves how okay. to do it. So we were like, me and Scott were just a two-man wrecking crew. like Right, doing so still just two people. Two people. When did you grow from two people? Yeah, you know, I think it was... Uh, uh, 10, 11? Gosh, when, was, when did we bring Amy, Amy and Chris on? So Scott's brother, Chris, was just straight out of college, um, and, and Amy was just like, she, she was a house, you know, house mom. Like she just worked at home with, you know, she was with her kids all wow. day. And, and so she needed something. <clears throat> so we brought her in, <clears throat> put her in charge of the books and, and helping us with some of the kind of like the, the, you know, the daily tasks. And, uh, that was like maybe a year in, a year and a half in. About a year in. Yeah. You needed some growth. You needed some extra. Yeah. Help. We, we got, we had a lot of customers in the first year. Okay. So. Okay. So you need some support. We needed some support. Okay. That so they sense. jumped in and they're still there today. They're still oozled today, actually. Both of them. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm, we'll get to Chris. Cause yeah. isn't he still like the CEO? CEO yeah. yeah. I was going to yeah. say he's still run. That was part of the deal uh, mm-hmm. when we sold that, but we'll talk about that. Yep. Um, so let's see. Oh seven, the launch, you grow to like two employees in Oh eight. Um, when I met you, there was like 40 something people. And since, yeah. since we sold it in 14, mm-hmm. we're only talking about a seven year run. Right. When did you start to like onboard employees? Like how long did that take you to go? Cause you, you hired Scott's brother. I get it. And you yeah. and Amy to help you with the books. But when was the big jump? Yeah, it was, it was every month or so we were hiring someone else after that. Just had to, we just had to needed the infrastructure. You guys mm-hmm. were still going out and crushing yeah. with sales. Yep. So Chris just started doing all the AdWords management at first. And yeah. then, and then we ended up adding in SEO, which is, which for people it's search engine optimization yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then, and then building websites and then doing all that stuff, you know, all the, all the agency kind of marketing type stuff. We just kind of turned to full digital marketing shop. So during the growth, what were some of the big, biggest obstacles that you had? Cause, and I would argue yeah. that selling wasn't an obstacle cause you were kind of cutting edge. You and Scott are rock stars. So you're out there getting clients like, but where were, where were the growing pains? Oh man, there was a lot of growing pains. Um, when we decided to do SEO, we didn't, know anything about SEO. Okay. So we kind of went and found another agency that did SEO uh, really well. You had to piggyback? We kind of like just, like they, a they were like good at it. Cause we, you know, I kind of always felt like no one's the jack of all trades. Totally. Right. Totally. And so we're like, Hey, these guys are really good at this. We're good at like the pay-per-click stuff. And so we found this company, um, and started working alongside them. Eventually we, uh, we left and one of their SEO guys that really liked us decided to just, you know, start his own business, oh. SEO business. It came over and wanted to manage our accounts. Long story short, him and the other guy ended up like taking all of our clients, like all of our, a lot of our SEO clients. It was a significant amount of money Dang, to man. start their own thing. So yeah, it's just, that was a, that was a growing was pain. A definite growing pain. Definite growing pain. So you're, you're, and I know you, yeah. I've known you for a while now, and I know that both you and Scott are super yeah. honest guys. Yeah. Like you're, that had to have been hard. Oh, it was hard. You, Cause you trust people. Like, yeah, I, I know you well enough that you're like a good hearted to- soul. Totally. And so I know you're like, hey, let's work out this JV. We'll work out this yeah. deal. And then the next thing you know, he's walking off with yeah. 30% of your clients and you're like, dang it. Yeah. And, 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 that, and that happened not just once, but twice. And so we, we uh, that was hard. I mean, I remember we let me and Scott laugh about it because we'd worked together for, I don't know, eight, yeah. eight, eight years. And like, there's two times he heard me like, just totally lose my cool. Like just start soaring up a storm. <laughs> this is one of them. This is one of them. This like, is one of them. Yeah. Well, dude, it's hard. Like when you get stabbed like this, yeah. like again, it's rough. I know I emphasize, but like, I mean this sincerely, like you're a really good dude. And so is Scott there. You guys are both like top shelf, honest entrepreneurs that have been successful in business without, in my opinion, the need for, um, misrepresentation or fraud or cutting corners. Like I, I mean this, like you guys are top shelf guys. Like you do things by the book. And even though there might be people out there that are more successful than you, 
you guys have always hung your hats on integrity and I've always respected you for that. Like you're good, solid guys. So, but the thing is, is that's gotta hurt. Yeah. Like yeah. We, have hurt. we just ended up learning a lot and make sure we had everything in writing, no more handshake agreements, yeah. you know, none of that stuff. We had to really grow up a it's little bit. It's an interesting lesson, right? Yeah. I think we all go through it as business owners that, um, you know, you want to just trust people based on handshakes, but eventually you get to the point where it's not offensive yeah. to ask for something in writing because you're just trying to spell it out just in case yeah. there's anything later that you have to reference. Yep. So good lesson. Yeah. Solid lesson to learn. Um, so let's, let's kind of fast forward to like around 14. Mm -hmm. And I want to touch on one thing about your business that I always thought was super impressive. Yeah. So you talk about pay-per-click, you talk about your call tracking, you talk about SEO. Mm -hmm. But when I met you, and this is now a little bit more commonplace, but, yeah. what, but what you, you were exposing um, was really cutting edge in my opinion. And that was the social um, social marketing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how you identified that for your dentist clients and the success that you saw early on. And again, I know it's more commonplace yeah. now in 22, but at the time I remember being like, this is genius. Yeah. The organic social marketing for those clients. Yeah. We got into app development and kind of like a uh, social media management um, when it was kind of hitting its stride. And, you know, for us, one of the things that I think we kind of hit on was like, how do you scale an agency? Right? Like every time you bring in a new client and there's some random industry, let's call it like gutter sure. replacement Whatever. or something, yeah. right? Like we had to come up with a brand new everything, like PPC strategy, SEO strategy, website, you know, all and start over. And, and we had to hire people. And so there was no like, you know, there's no like economies of scale. Like it was just like, oh man, this is a grind. So what we ended up doing is like figuring out verticals that like we had some clients in that we understood well, that we, that we felt really comfortable that we could do a really amazing job for. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we settled in on like beauty schools right. of all things. That's right. That was one of them. Yeah. Beauty schools was a big one, a dentist and then kind of like service companies like HVAC, you know, carpet cleaning, those and three. It, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I remember is you identified, um, high search volume. So you, you'd say people were searching for beauty schools, you know, mm -hmm. X amount of times a day. And then you were looking at so that you could rank and fairly easily, but then also you liked ticket price where it was a, a higher ticketed item. So instead of something being like $40, you were looking for stuff that was higher so that the, uh, the marketing budget could be bigger and the ROI could be great for your client. Is that, yeah, I, I kind of came up with what that? we what I call a vertical metric scorecard yeah, yeah, we'll talk where I kind of had like just different things that I'd be like, okay, well, you know, how many competitors are in the space? Right. Like how much will this, you know, customer pay? Like how much of a pain are they to work with? Right. Uh, you, you know, yeah, you know, point. some of those things, search volume, all that stuff too. We just kind of just like gritted it out and, and realized like, you know, and who do we understand? Like who do we have a great client in that could be like a champion for us, yeah. right? That we right. could launch us into other things. And so like, for example, we had a couple of beauty schools that we were just kind of killing it for. And uh, we saw, well, this is one of the verticals, it, it, like kind of the rose to the top that, from all the things that we were looking at. And so we thought, well, let's go fish out of a barrel. Like, let's go like speak at a conference and talk about social media. So that, back Got to it. your question, because yes. this circles back to social media. We're like, we start realizing, gosh, we need to help people. They have no idea what to do with social. And so we ended up just like kind of wrapping our head around a couple of verticals and then just diving in on like what the social strategy should be for and, them. And did you build early app? software where it was encouraging people to leave the reviews because again, now it's fairly normal yeah. that you're building this in, but in 14, this was like kind of cutting edge. Yeah. Yeah. We were right at the, kind of the head of that. And, uh, you know, in hindsight, I wish, you know, obviously looking back that like, gosh, if we would have just stuck with this, or even if we would just stuck with call tracking from the very beginning, you know, like call tracking customers are still there. Yeah. They're still there. Yeah. It was like, they were the stickiest thing. And, yeah. and man, and I saw some other companies come along that just did the call tracking stuck with it. Even though it was smaller dollar amounts, we got, we kind of started chasing flashy, like $10,000 websites, mm -hmm. not realizing mm -hmm. like you don't really mm -hmm. keep a lot of that. So, yeah. so in hindsight, I wish we would have kind of like stuck with a couple other things, but, uh, um, but yeah, we, we ended up kind of just like going to conferences and, you know, one of the conferences we went to, we were speaking at it and we got approached by Paul Mitchell, you know, one of the largest franchises of beauty schools. And they're like, we want an exclusive contract with you guys. And they kind of knew we, we were just onto things. And so that's kind of how things started. Like we realized, it's okay. Amazing. And, and, and today, uh, you know, Oozle has what's called beauty as a business. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, they really, they really just like own that industry. Do they? Like they are like, crushing the it. yeah, if you're a beauty school, like Oozle who you'd want to work with. That's who you want to work with. For sure. They just own it. They Totally understand. That's it. amazing. So let's let's talk about that um, transition because we didn't know each other at yeah. all. I got mm -hmm. a phone call from you guys out yeah. of the blue, and it was like, "Hey, Travis Scott, we're thinking about selling our business. Um, what 
got you thinking about selling your company? Yeah. Oh man. So that's actually really funny. I ended up, I remember reading the book, start with why from Simon Sinek. Yeah. And, uh, I remember just like sitting down one day and be like, what is my why? And I remember it really bothered me that I didn't know what it was. It was a couple of things. It was that and being like, gosh, what problem do I really want to solve in the world? Am I really going to go give a Ted talk about like internet marketing? And like, and, and I had no interest in that. So are you saying it didn't resonate with didn't, your core? Yeah. It's just like, I didn't really That's care. Okay. I didn't really care about That's it. And, and well, I have three boys. I'm like, what legacy am I leave them? And, right. and for me, I've always just wanted to solve a big problem in the world yeah. that really resonated with me. And I didn't know what that was. And so that was one thing. The other thing too was like, I, I, anytime I f don't feel comfortable s selling something, I know it's time for me to move on. Interesting. And so for me, like SEO, for example, I'd had a customer that didn't pay us two, three thousand dollars a month or something. You know, a good friend of mine, and 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 Google changed their algorithm all of a sudden. Yes. So he comes to me and is like, hey. Dude, well, I've been paying you this much for two years. What, what happened to all my rankings? And like, oh, they changed their algorithm. Sorry. And and uh, I just couldn't like get behind selling something that like was out of my control. Yeah, totally out of my control. And that, at that time, that was the biggest money maker for us with SEO. But again, it just comes back to the point I, I I emphasized on your integrity. Like, there's a lot of people out there that have zero issue. Right. Selling whatever they got to sell. They, in, in that's order true. To kill, that's true. In order for, to for me, I can't sell something I don't believe in. It's just part of my ethos. And so I, I just, and, and Scott felt the same way. And so we both knew we needed to move on. So that was just kind of where we knew, like, I'm not passionate about this. You're not passionate about this. Let, let, let's do something. Let's, let's maybe look at like putting uh, a couple of people in place so that when we do sell out, we're not handcuffed to this thing. Makes sense. And so we kind of, so put, you guys were kind of at a personal crossroads, let's personal call it, crossroads where you were searching for your why you had built a successful business. You guys were making good money. Um, hopefully your wives are cool about talking to this, but I remember when you went back and kind of told them oh, they were mad, they were kind of on the fence because oh. both of them to their, to their credit and to their defense, they had finally gotten you two to a place of stability. Yeah. Like, let's be honest. Totally. You guys are both, you know, rock star salespeople, but sales is cyclical and yeah. your income goes up and down. You'd finally gotten to a place where both of you were clearing 250 plus mm -hmm. easy. Yeah. You had a nice stable business. The economy was finally back. And then the two of you go and you're like, hey, we're going to sell this business. Yeah. And I remember there was some resistance. <laughs> and again, to their defense, I can see why they finally got you to this success place where they were probably feeling comfortable and stable and definitely. And you're like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to sell this. And, and that was honestly another reason why I knew I needed to do it. Like I don't ever love being in a, a position where I'm feeling super comfortable. It's Cause like, you're an entrepreneur. Man. Yeah. You, I, I want to stretch the limits a little builds bit and, into your DNA. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about this for a second. So I remember we got, we got pretty decent traction. You were in a unique space. Um, as we did your advertising and marketing and we put it out to our buyer group and stuff, it wasn't a business that was designed yeah. for everybody. I'm just yeah. based on what I remember. Yep. I remember the, the traction from buyers was good, but it wasn't great. And the reason being was, was as follows one, it was a seven figure deal, which not everybody can qualify for Two, You're in a space that appears at least appears on the surface that you need some skills. Yeah. You're in marketing. Not every buyer is going to come with the same set of skills right. of like understanding, yeah. especially internet marketing. Mm -hmm. And then I'm trying to think of what the other one was. Um, th I think those were the two big standouts, but eventually we found a buyer. Actually we had several meetings. I, I would say we had at least a handful of meetings with buyers. We got a few offers that were not good enough. And then finally we got one that was, Good enough. Yeah. Well, what, what actually happened was before we even met with you, we were working with a different broker. Oh, you were? Yeah. It you was like, yeah, this was like over a year. We kind of just engaged uh, somebody and, and, uh, we had a lot of, you know, our time was wasted a lot. Like we just, oh. like it was the wrong, clearly the wrong type of buyer. Like they hadn't done the diligence to put this together the right way. And it kind of just, we had a bad taste in our mouth and, uh, you know, from the process and we're like, this is just, this is stupid. And we had a couple companies that were really well known Utah companies. Um, one that has kind of a, a digital company here that clearly was just like looking behind the curtain to see what we were doing. Oh, and really? Yeah. Just to uh, learn stuff. And so the broker didn't vet them. Yeah. They didn't vet, enough, didn't vet them hard at advice. all. And so we finally just started, we got to find somebody. So we started hitting our network up and then your name came up. And uh, by the, when we met you and by the time we sold, it was like three, four months. So it was like, it was fast. quick. Yeah. I think it was within six. Was it six we, months? We had, I knew it was quick. We had about three months of, you know, just putting it all. Yeah. Together. Yeah. Yeah. Three putting months together. putting together. But when we finally like, kind of traction hit the road. Yeah. We, we figured it out. And, and the thing that I liked about it, um, was just that you didn't mess around. Like you, like, you know, it wasn't, 
you let them know very clearly. And there's a few meetings that, you know, got a little bit hairy because you're like, dude, are you even serious about this still? Yeah. And you would like throw it out on the carpet. And we like kind of felt uncomfortable because we're like these non-confrontational you're guys. You're non-confrontational But dude. the fact is, is that you didn't want to waste our time and you didn't want to waste your time. Yeah. And in hindsight, like it was, it was good. Yeah. And no. we did people out. Yeah. I was going to, so one of the things that I try to express to my clients up front is I tell them, I said, listen, I've sold six of my personal mm -hmm. personal companies. I'm now over 300 million in businesses. Yeah. Sold. Like since that's I mean, amazing. It's been a long time. Yeah, that's by the way. I've been doing awesome. this. No, I appreciate it. But the point is, is I tell all my clients up front this, I said, look, the reason that I'm in this space still is not for the money. It's because I still am fairly passionate about providing great representation to business sellers, because I know how important it is to you yeah. when you're selling a business. And what I tell them up front is my blessing and my curse is I'm going to treat this deal like it's my own yeah. deal. You're going to get all the advice. Yeah. You're going to get all the passion that yep. I bring to the table. Totally. And you're going to hear me say things. And you're going to be like, man, why is he so fired up about this or that? Yeah. It's because I've been there. I've yeah. been there when buyers are trying to peek behind the curtain to yep. steal information from you. And I'm really protective over yeah. that stuff. And still to this day, yeah. it's the same process. Yeah. So I'm, I appreciate you bringing that up because um, sometimes, you know, it's like a walk on eggshells where I don't want to be like that. But at the end of the day, I always go back to, well, what would I do? If this yeah. was my seven figure yeah. deal, what would I do? And I would protect it with everything I possibly can. I'd want to find the right buyer. I'd want to get the best price. Yeah. And so it's interesting you remember that, even though it's been like eight yeah. years since we did the deal. But and, and I've had people, business owners that hit me up that said, hey, how was the process? Like I've been thinking about selling. I think I've maybe sent a few referrals. You and, have. And, and I remember those people, um, you know, the thing that I told them is I said, hey, look, you know, like Josh isn't going to waste time. Like he, he's going to jump in. He's going to find the, he's going to do all the diligence that you would expect and want from someone to do. And then he's going to go out and find the right buyers. He's not going to waste your time. He's not gonna waste his time. Yeah. So he's going to be very direct and upfront with people. That's because got to get this done. Like gotta you don't have time done. to drag this out for a year. Like what we experienced before, like that sucked. No, it's true. And you know, your time is valuable. My time is valuable, but I also believe in process and order. And the longer deals go, the more they have a likelihood it's true. of not closing. It's like sales in general, you right? You just got to keep like, it clipping. You got to keep it clipping. So yep. um, we kind of already have talked about some of this stuff, but the due diligence process, I think we gave them about 45 days. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how that went for you? Oh, man, it's been a while. I, I, I just remember that it was pretty smooth. Like, uh, you know, we went through the process. We kind of like felt how oh, this is too good to be true. Um you know, but it like, just kind of like, it was pretty smooth. Like we didn't have to do a lot. Like you handled it all. And so to your credit though, and this is to your guys' credit, you guys did have good books. Yeah. Everything was dialed in. Yeah. A lot of business owners don't do that, right. but you guys were dialed. You had your tax returns right. done. They weren't super messy. You know, yeah. Scott wasn't out there like buying a bunch of Gucci and like yeah. piping it through the business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was pretty clean. And, and the thing that I think that we realized is that we weren't good at those sorts of things. And so like we had our wives kind of involved, like doing some of that stuff in the early days. And then, and then, um, you know, you know, that, that's just like hard sometimes, you know, when, when you have family involved and, you know, you, you know, me and Scott were good friends and we we're like, oh, let's maybe bring some people in here that know what they're doing. So we ended up just like really being smart about surrounding ourselves right. with capable, solid smart people, people, solid people that, that, were, that were better, way better than we were at certain things. And then pretty soon by the end of it, like the last few years, like we just like strolled around the office and played ping pong. You like did, we were, like which we was here. so shocking to me. I remember seeing your work <laughs> environment being, being like, you guys have like 16 ping pong tables. Like what's the deal? And you kept saying, it's all about culture nowadays. Like with the younger generation, yeah. you have to create a work environment that they love that they want to be at, if they want to take a break and play ping pong, like that's the way it is, Josh. And you remember me, I was like always in a suit when I showed up. Yeah. It was so foreign to me. I'm like, what is this place? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think, I think that worked because Scott's it brother's did. still there. My brother's still there. Yeah. Uh, Amy's still there. So a lot of people we cared about, that was the biggest thing for us, by the way, Josh is like the thing that we was most important to us was that we sold the company to somebody that we felt was going to come in and take care of our family. Yeah. And you know, and, and today he's still there today and he's doing, and, he, and they all love him. Like, yeah. Like the guy we sold to, like, yeah. He's been a good fit. No. And that, that, that's, that was the thing I had anxiety about. Yeah. No, oh, and that's fair. And I remember, um, we can talk a little bit about this, but that was, that was when the deal got hairy. It wasn't price. It wasn't numbers. But right at the end, don't you remember, there was a lot of negotiation over Chris. Mm -hmm. Chris being Scott Linford's yeah. brother, stepping into the CEO, what that transition yeah. was going to look like, how long it was going to yeah. be. And there was even a lot of apprehension from Chris mm -hmm. because it felt For like sure. we were using him as a chip. Totally. Like you guys were bailing with yeah. some cash, but we were using Chris as the yeah. chip of like, 
hey, we're going to negotiate you into this deal. And yeah. We're going to get money, but you're going to stay. Yeah. Do you remember that? We, yeah. We, yeah. And we got some advice a couple of years before saying like, look, you know, like the golden handcuffs suck. Like if you can prove that like the companies can operate without you guys involved, that's going to be ideal for you. And so, and so Chris was a key to that because. So he, I know you, you can't know. speak for Chris, but speak maybe in generalities. Yeah. How has that transition process been? He's been, been awesome. For? Well, I know he's oh, yeah. I know he's a rock star, but I'm saying we sell. Yeah. Think back, I know it's been a long time, but think back to like the 90 day transition mm-hmm. of when you guys were phasing out and Chris was kind of stepping in. Yeah. What did that look like? Yeah. It was pretty seamless, honestly. It was Chris and another guy. There was two of them, the CEO and the COO. Um, his name is Dave Smith. That uh, you know, they they had just been running the show for two years. Just kept doing it no matter they what. Just, just do, they started, kept doing what they were doing. It was nothing different. So how did that make the buyer feel? I think that the buyer was just really grateful that we were very transparent about that and that that wasn't and like was some charade. Like it wasn't it you was know, some facade. It, yeah. was, it was real. And he realized like, oh my gosh, Travis and Scott really didn't do anything. Like they, <laughs> like they sold here and there, right? But yeah, like yeah, yeah. at that point, we already had other people selling. That's amazing. So, so we were able to just kind of like walk away. And, and you know, the deal was structured in a way that gave some protections. A little bit. It gave us like mostly what we wanted, yeah. but it gave a little bit of protection for the owner. So we still had like, you know, we still wanted Uzzle to succeed. It wasn't like, you know, like, ah, oh, if they fail, who cares? Like, like we had a little bit, you know, the way it was structured that like, you know, we needed to care a little bit, which, which was great. Mm-hmm. I think it was smart the way that it was structured was mm-hmm. smart. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to emphasize one thing here is because I get this question quite a bit of, you know, what makes, what makes a business worth more? And I always say it's, it's hard to believe, but the owners themselves can't be the key to the business succeeding. Right. No buyer is going to be able to come yeah. in and replace you. If yeah. you're a secret sauce with all these secret relationships, yeah that's going to come out during due diligence mm-hmm. and someone may still still be willing to pay for your business, but it'll probably be a lesser value because mm-hmm. they understand that when you leave, there's going to be some attrition. Yeah, totally. I, I always thought what was amazing is like you just said, you were transparent with the buyer and granted, you know, it's their choice to believe you, but you yeah. were like, look, we have put these people in place. Mm-hmm. They are running it. We are, you know, kind of out the door already. Yes. We still do some things. Yeah. But as far as core component, to this business, the two people that are running it are gonna stay. Yep. And the buyer took a risk and obviously bought it, but obviously, like you said, he was very pleasantly surprised when mm-hmm. that was true. Yeah. And that is, in my opinion, why the business has con- continued to succeed. But also, you said they're killing it now. Like, yeah. the transition's been great. Yeah, they're doing well. They've stuck to that kind of the verticals and and uh, they've been really smart. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really happy that the company's doing well. You should be. And, uh, you know, I think that that's something that, uh, it's a testament to something you built. Yeah. You put great people, like you said, in place, which allowed somebody to pay a premium for the business, but continue on. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was our family. It was our family. We treated it that way. And so we were, that was the thing that we were mostly worried about. So let's talk about this. Yeah. So you get out. Yeah. Talk about your transition. Oh man. So this is your, was this your first sale? This this is a, like the actual sale here. No, we sold a company called Half Price Utah. Oh, that's right. I remember. And, that. and then, um, but nothing like this. Nothing like this. this no, was that was like seven figure big yeah, transition. Yeah, yeah. What was it like? Like, give me the six to twelve month transition. What did you do? How did it make you feel? Yeah. What'd you go through? Yeah, you know, it was really, really interesting. It was actually the two hardest years of my life. Really? Yeah. After we sold the company, and here's why. So it all comes down to the why, right? For me, um, you know, I knew I wanted to sell the business because I wanted to find that why, but I didn't know what it was. So when we sold the business, like I spent two years trying to figure out my why. And it was so frustrating. Like I was trying everything I could. Like I had ideas. I always had ideas. Always. But but for me, it was, I, if I was going to make something, I wanted to make a difference. Like mm-hmm. that was really important to mm-hmm. me. And, uh, you know, I wanted to leave a legacy. I wanted to be able to like, what am I going to give a TED talk? I wanted to, what is my thing that I'm going to be known for? And, and so I spent two years trying to figure that out. And uh, finally, at the end of two years, like my wife's like, dude, you've blown through all of our savings. Like you, you got to go get a job, like go get a job somewhere. And so I went to lunch with a mentor of mine. And I remember I was just like at my end of my leash. I was just like dying. And uh, we were sitting at J dogs in Fort Union in uh, Salt Lake. And I remember going to lunch with this guy and um, you know, he started, I started just unloading on this guy. Like, I'm so frustrated. Like, I can't like get inspiration for what I want to do. And he started just asking me, well, how do you get inspiration? Like, tell me about how you get inspiration. Tell me about times in your life when you've been the most inspired. And I ended up just talking to this guy about times in my life where I've received some pretty amazing inspiration. One of the experiences I shared with him was when I was 12 years old. So my parents, uh, I lived a pretty normal life up until I was 11 and a half. And, uh, you know, awesome neighborhood, friends, like, you know, idyllic 
family. And all of a sudden parents sat us down, they're getting divorced, right? My mom met this guy who was a pilot. She's leaving my dad. Me and my sis, two sisters moving with my mom. And, you know, I, I you know, it's a pretty hard time. And then, uh, you know, around my birthday is actually the day before my birthday. My, you know, my mom needed to actually fly to Colorado for a singing competition with her boyfriend. And so they were going to be flying and, uh, they, they took off and they ended up flying to Colorado. And I remember on my birthday, celebrating my birthday, we were at the sports mall in Salt Lake. And also my dad walks in and his face was all white and he, he was just like, kids, we got to go. And so he loaded us in the car, started driving to grandma's house. I knew something that was wrong. I thought maybe my grandma had died cause she had emphysema. And, and so I, I walk into her house and here she is sitting on the couch. I'm like, Oh crap. Turn on the news plane crashed in Colorado. Right. Everybody, every, everybody was presumed dead. And uh, my mom died in this plane accident. And, you know, I remember like, it was really hard because one, I had treated really bad before she died because I was really upset about the divorce. And I knew that this pilot was the reason she left my dad. And, and so I was just grappling with some stuff there. And then, you know, I ended up having some really amazing spiritual, like kind of really cool experiences that I was just sharing with this guy. And one of those experiences was this dream that I had about her after she died. I remember just pulling myself over this boulder and seeing this plane fuselage. And I ended up talking to my mom. I saw her on the other side and we ended up like walking around this mountainside and it was just one of these re very real dreams. So without going into too much detail, I just like had this amazing dream and I was telling this guy about it. And I'm like, hey, you know, I've always wanted to go there. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You haven't been there? Wait, why haven't you done this? It's yeah. been 27 years. No kidding. I'm like, I just, I don't know. I've never done it. He's like, okay, before you leave lunch today, call your two sisters and plan that trip or you're never going to do it. Wow. So I call my sisters up and we plan this trip for August. And uh, I'm so pumped, right? Like I, I didn't even know where this plane went down. And so I actually like tracked down the first responder, this guy named Steve Jewett. It was his first search and rescue from however long ago. And he's like, I totally remember this. And he's like, I was actually snowshoeing, snowshoeing in and, uh, you know, checking out the scene and this avalanche breaks. He had to get into the plane fuselage to survive this avalanche. And so anyway, long story short, he remembered this story. Wow. He's like, this is where it is. And he got me the map and he helped me out. Anyways, we ended up planning this trip and the day before we were going to leave, I remembered that my mom's wallet had been returned to me shortly after she died. And inside of her wallet was a bunch of money for a 12 year old, a couple hundred bucks is a lot of money, but I could never bring myself to spend it because I considered it sacred money. So mm -hmm. I put it in this picture frame, fanned out money. And, uh, all of a sudden I had this idea the day before I'm leaving with my sisters to go to this place. I said, did you guys know that I've had this money from mom's wallet all these years <laughs> that I just held on to? Why don't we have mom pay for our dinner tonight? That's amazing. Like, why don't we have her pay for our river rafting experience? And I went on this trip with my sisters and I remember like listening to her favorite music, which was John Denver and playing her favorite board games and hanging out with my sisters. And I was in total flow for like three days. For sure. And I just started thinking about this concept of sacred money. I thought, gosh, you know, if you had sacred money, what would you spend it on? It's amazing. And when you ask someone that question, if they had a thousand dollars of sacred money versus just a thousand bucks, like their answers are totally different. And I started thinking about like happiness in general. I thought, gosh, we've never been more affluent as a society, but we've never been unhappier. Right. There's not a correlation with people that have a lot of money and people that are like happy, at least from what I found from founders I knew and other things. So I thought, well, clearly people are spending money on the stupidest Stupid things. Stupid stuff. Like why aren't they spending money on things that matter sure. and that can like improve their happiness? So I started nerding out about the science of happiness and looking at all the studies and research and decided I want to start a company that would allow people to set aside sacred money into what we call your work-life balance account yeah. and be able to get companies to match money towards things you actually cared about. Right. Not stupid gift cards sure. and, and crap and stuff. Buka de Beppo that nonsense. doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. And so sure. like I thought of salespeople and I thought like, gosh, it's just so coin operated. You know, how do you intrinsically motivate a salesperson or like anybody? And I just started realizing there's a huge problem here. And that was the problem I set out to solve. And is that what you're doing now? That's what I'm doing now. Tell me about it. Yeah. So work life, that's what we're building as a tech company. Um, you know, we've, we've got, cool four VCs that are backing us and about 25 angel investors. And how much have you raised? Uh, we raised 1.65 awesome. million in pre-seed round. Okay, yeah. Cool. And we're actually just launching our first, uh, pri uh, uh, customer on July 22nd, in like a couple of weeks. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. And I know you've done this. You kind of did it a few times, but then you've landed with work life. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is when I had the idea for, um, work life in 2017, August, Yeah. It, I knew how hard it was to find your why. And I didn't want to screw it up. And I talked about earlier about like risk mitigation, right? Like I needed to test out my hypothesis. I needed to validate some assumptions. Mm. And so like, I, I thought, well, here's this, it was a seven year plan to launch this company. And I knew that this was probably a company I'd want to ride into the sunset. Like it's not something that I'm looking just to like 
understood becoming a unicorn or whatever. Yeah. And so like I went to my friend, Jaron Paul at yep. the time who had sold a company called Capture, yep. and, uh, and was talking about this idea. And I said, yeah, I need to like, I, I've never actually ran a tech company. So I need to like get into a tech company. I, that was my first stage. And yeah. He's like, well, I'm just starting. He's like, I'm sorry. I have this idea called Spiff. I'm yes. just getting it going. Right. And he's like, why don't you come help me with that? Give me at least a year, you know, and type thing. And, and so I said, awesome, let's do it. And so they were like handling, they were like going to like figure out comp, like, mm-hmm. you know, like commissions are always wrong for salespeople because mm-hmm. it's in a spreadsheet mm-hmm. somewhere mm-hmm. and someone screws the spreadsheet up and suddenly reps are pissed because you're paying them wrong. I'm like, oh, well, this is cool. Transparency and visibility and commissions and making sure they're accurate. Mm-hmm. And so like I could wrap my head around that. And then while I was going to be meeting with sales leaders, I'm like, oh, by the way, for incentives, like how are you going to like intrinsically motivate salespeople? Like you got to get away from like just cash and gift cards. Sure. And stupid President's Club trips to Cancun that nobody sure. wants to do. Sure. You know, and so anyways, it gave me an opportunity to like, kind of validate this idea and talk to a lot of sales leaders. And so I went and did that. And Spiff today, I mean, they just raised their, ser- or they raised the Series B, you know, 50 something million dollars. They're crushing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, they're doing just well. Just I mean, crushing it. I've seen it, and that's why I knew you yeah. were associated with that. But you weren't a partner. That was kind of more of a come, learn. No, I was like one of the, considered co-founder with with the other with okay. the other group. So yeah, so I joined in very early with, well, I mean, so I have like a lot of oh, stock. and some. Yeah, okay, and good, so, you great. know, we have opportunity for secondaries and Is stuff. Is it not and, considered then a conflict of interest, work life? No. Not at all. No, they're doing comp. It's funny because their name is Spiff, but yeah. they actually don't do Spiff. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> that's kind of funny. That's why I always, I didn't know if there was something. Yeah, they don't. No, there. they don't do spiffs. They just do comp. They just do comp. And uh, and so like I wanted to do spiffs. So yes. I'm like, so like it's actually a perfect potential partnership. Great. So we'll we'll see where that goes. But uh, relationship I relationship with Jaren still. Yeah. Solid. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, I love it's the spiff great. guys. Yeah. Like super cool. Um. Uh. So yeah, I did spiff for a little bit, and then like I, I knew that like experiences were going to be part of the equation. I'm like, people need to like go have peak experiences yes. like the one I had. And so I started looking for experience providers, and I found a company called Blueboard out of San Francisco. Yeah. That was like kind of like an award co or like an OC Tanner, but instead of like stuff. It was like experiences. experiences. So like they went to the total opposite extreme. It's like, it's all about experiences, you know? And so they had like a, you know, a curation team and like a concierge team that like handled everything for you. And so it's kind of like a techified travel agency in a way. And so they like would give, it was a reward and recognition platform. So you'd reward your people with experience of their choice. They'd go through and be like, Oh, the James Bond experience. I'm going to go yeah. fly to England, yeah, yeah, yeah. drive a Maserati around all day, like whatever. And so I, I decided like, well, that's, that's like kind of a good next place to go. So I actually met, met founders one day in San Francisco. So I want to work for you. And they're like, well, you're like a co-founder of like this tech company. I'm like, yeah, yeah but here's my ultimate, ultimate vision. And I, and I was very upfront about like the company I wanted to launch. And uh, I, I said, look, if, if you help me, if I help you, like you guys are selling to HR right now, let me come in, like, like help you productize for like sales incentives, like to figure out how to like get into like sales teams. They mm-hmm. have spiffs all the time mm-hmm. and they, they're always trying to guess what people want. Like you guys have this platform. And, uh, and then eventually, you know, maybe I can launch this thing and you guys could be like a provider of like experiences for like, but, but people would be like putting a dollar in their company matches a few dollars and then they can like have an experience they want to work towards as opposed to just getting rewarded with an experience from HR. So it was like, it, it seemed like a win-win. And so I joined Blue Board and, and did that for a little bit. And then ultimately after, you know, I validated, tested some things on the HR side because we're kind of like incentives and benefit personalization. Um, I was ready to go and yeah. I, I was able to do it in four years. What I thought was gonna take seven. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. So to sum this up, yep. a couple, couple last questions. Looking back, you know, what did you learn about selling your business? First question. Yeah. And the second question is, is there anything that you do differently? Um, I'll answer the second question first. There's nothing I would have done differently. Um, it was the exact right thing to do. Okay. And, um, you know, my wife didn't love the decision. All, all, all the people around me didn't understand the decision. Yep. But I, me and Scott both will tell you, like, that was the right thing for us to do at the time. They're like, oh, you should have just cash flowed the business and all this stuff. Like, no, no, we just needed to, like, clean break and just find out what we needed to go do. And, right. and we ended up like going down different paths because he wanted to do what I didn't want to do. And, yep. and that was fine. And we're yep. still like, You're still great we actually us. office out of the same building and we're like super close still. Yep. Um, but yeah, what was the first question What did you again? learn? In the whole process? Yeah, what did you learn about selling your business? Did you learn anything? Yeah, the, gosh, there was tons of learnings. I'm just trying to think what to just distill it down to. Yeah, for me, I mean, I, I just, you know, the advice that I give people all the time is just like, just to make sure that, they love what they do, honestly. Like it's really important. Life's too short, right? I agree. Like it's too short. Like you really got to enjoy. We're older it. now. Yeah. And you get here. Yeah. And you start to realize that. Yeah. It's hard when you're in your twenties. It you is. You know what I mean? Like selling for uh, super pages or whatever. Yeah. You're just about the money, and you're like, want to buy that car or whatever. And are you over forty now? Yeah. Yeah. So we're like, we're there. You start to just view life differently. Yeah. About really like focusing on things that you love that bring you joy. 
Because the money will always come. Yeah, the money will always come. And, and that's honestly part of what we're doing now. I mean, with, with work life is like, we're like, why don't companies just care about things that people care about and like make sure that when they are working for you, that they're, that they're doing inspired work. I love it. Right? I love it, man. And you are doing inspired work. Yeah. And at the time, like the things for me is like, I just wasn't doing inspired work. Like it wasn't inspiring me. I wasn't waking up getting excited and motivated to go in the office and just like go ready to crush it's it. It's a great like, lesson. Like it was just, it was just money. It's a great lesson. It was just money. And so like, to me, it was just like, you know, if it's just about the money, then there's a problem. Yep. You know, I'd go to sales leaders. I remember early on talking to him about this new idea and, and I'm like, Oh yeah. You like, like say when I was at blue board, I was like, Oh, what about experiences? And they're like, ah, oh, my reps just want cash. I'm like, well, look, my middle child just wants sugar cereal. Every sure, meal. We don't give it to that's him legitimately what he wants. No, and sure. if that's all I fed him, he'd be happy. I mean, but I know that it's not gonna help him be happy or healthier. <laughs> yeah. if that's all I give him to, no to eat. Right. So it's the same as sales. He's just like, look, you know, like, yeah, they're going to just tell you cash because they just default to that. But look, guess what? You know, there's no correlation with making lots of money and being happy. So how do we actually solve for happiness for people? And so I'm just really excited to kind of finally have that, um, that, that why. And, and Uzo, you know, that the cool thing about Uzo is like, it gave me the opportunity to, to be able to do what I'm doing now. And yeah. I'm so grateful for it. I right. look at like Elon Musk, like he wasn't passionate about payment processing, but PayPal unlocked the freedom for him to go do things he was passionate about. Agreed. So there's nothing wrong with like doing things to like unlock that freedom that you need. <clears throat> to same go transition. Do things. Yeah. Same, same thing. transition, smaller scale, same yeah. transition. Yeah. Last two questions. Um, got any good books that you'd recommend? Give me one, maybe two. A lot of entrepreneurs yeah. and business owners read them. You have to sift through a lot of regurgitated yeah, stuff yeah. to find some gems. Yeah. It, one, some gems. one brand new book that just came out, uh, Russ Laraway um, wrote a book called When They Win, You Win. Okay. And it's all like managers are failing at an epic level. People leave managers, not companies. And because managers, like sometimes they're thrown into management because they were, say it's in sales, right? right. They were a good individual contributor. Yeah, they move into management. They know nothing about inspiring people. Interesting. And so they're not equipped with tools and resources to be able to help them be successful. And and, and what Russ uh, kind of gives is a, is, a, is, a, is a really amazing, like, kind of formula to being an amazing manager. And then like, we're actually creating a tool set to like kind of go alongside with what he does. So that's probably why it resonated so strongly with me, but I just love uh, his stories. He, he was at Google, then he was at Twitter and then he was at Qualtrics. He was like one of the, you know, the kind of like a yeah. chief people experience person at, at Qualtrics. Yeah. And so that's an amazing book. That I just recently read it one more time. It's called uh, when they, when you win, when they, win you win. Yeah. Russ Laraway. Awesome book, man. If you're a manager, you have to read that book. I think that's like, good. I, like haven't, you, I haven't even heard. Yeah. Of it it yet, just so came out like literally two weeks ago. So it's fantastic. Amazing book. Uh, the other go-to book for me is called creativity Inc. Creativity it's from Inc. the founders of Pixar. Okay. So, you know, Steve Jobs company, yeah. right? But, um, um, you know, that, that book, uh, Ed Catmull, uh, was the guy that, that wrote that book. And, uh, the thing that I love about that book is that like, you know, Pixar went through this time where they like had just movie after movie after movie, like hit after hit just after crushed. hit, just crush it. Toy Story, the yeah. Monsters Inc. Cars, you know, all this stuff. And they were just like destroying it. And they attributed all their success to what they called their brain trust, mm. which is like very, you know, passionate group of people that are very candid, but they're candid because there's a lot of trust yeah. there and love. And so they get into a room and they're like, oh, here's this movie idea for, let's just call it up or whatever. And it's about, it's going to originally be about these like two spoiled, like sons of this giant that are up on this cloud. And it was totally different. Yeah. And you know, they're just like, ah, oh, this doesn't feel right to me. And they didn't have to have a solution all the time, but they just kind of like went through this process of like trusting each other right. and not getting too married to their idea to be offended and all this stuff. So a lot of emotional intelligence that you have to have in this group. And anyways, they ended up just like creating this, this uh, ability to just like be very creative and very honest and like, and, and figure things out. And so what I've kind of taken with me from that book is just like this brain trust concept. And it's kind of how I built my current team is like, I've got this brain trust. And I'm able to like, just like, I want people to push back on me. Like I, I'm like, Hey, my idea is like, nine out of 10, they're going to be stupid, but I'm yeah. going to hit that home run idea every once in a while. Right. Push but back. like, I want them to push back on me. I want to figure things out. And so we're, we're in like a quest for what we call trues at work life. Like we want to know what are our truths? What are the things that we're going to just cement in stone? Like they're going to be very hard to displace. And those truths don't come along very often, but when we find them, like that's our quest is to seek these truths and to know who we are and why we are and, and all of that. And so that's just another book that, uh, I just think is a good business book. Um, but I think everybody should kind of be looking into that brain trust concept. Solid. Yeah. Solid. So, so those are two. Last question. Yeah. If you could give a young business owner, a business owner, entrepreneur, whatever it is, just one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh man. I, I, I it, it, for me, it's just, I know it sounds cliche, the whole why thing, but I think it's really, really important. And, and you know, maybe the why is just like making money so you can go do the things you want to go do. Yeah. And that's okay. Sure. That's great. But yeah. I think it's really important that people understand what, what they're doing it all for and, and making sure that like, you know, that they understand what really is going to 
help them be happy at the end of the day. I, I know a lot of business owners that are so focused on creating a billion dollar business right. that they neglect everybody in their life that's important to them. And I'm like, what, what good is that going to do for you to retire with all this money and all the people that you, you love all your hate you? Yeah. Like, what fair, is the point? Fair, what is the point of fair. having a billion dollars? I'm like, what? You know, so I kind of just like to talk to, you know, business owners, my friends that are like, I know a lot of small business owners and just talk to them and just say, look, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? And, and, and at the end of the day, I always kind of just come back to this like 75 year study in happiness that is the longest ongoing research study, you know, out of Harvard that tracked people from JFK clear to, you know, you know, through their life. And they, they attribute the, you know, the biggest indicator for uh, a healthy and long life is your relationships. It's the connections you have. And the more, you know, it's not necessarily about quality is, or quantity is, is quality. It, it, but, but if all you have is like one key relationship and that person dies, like it just shows people's health Boom. just dives done. Yeah. like, and they're done. Right. So like, it's really important to have a lot, you know, a good number of like quality, really quality, quality relationships. relationships in your life and make sure that you're investing in those relationships. Like I'll, I'll have like a business owner who has a 15 year old I'll be like, what do, what do you have planned with that 15 year old? They're going to be out of the house in three years and it's going to go by that fast. hundred percent. What do you have on your calendar? So we'll have them go create a work life goal and make sure like, Hey, this Japan trip that your 15 year old wants to make that happen. If you don't put on the calendar, it's never going to happen. Never so I happen. want to do for people what my, I want my software to do for people what my mentor did for me, which is to pull out of me something I hadn't consciously thought about and it changed my life. And so I want to hopefully do that for people where I can be like, get it on the calendar, identify what that sacred money should be used for and go do things that are going to make a difference in your happiness. And so that's kind of like what I'm like, that's always going to be the advice I give people is cha like find that happiness equation in your life. That last comment that you just made just gave me the chills, man. Like it just, it gives me the chills that what you're doing now resonates with who you are. Yeah. It resonates with your why, but like you said, your mentor pulled mm -hmm. something out of you that brought you face to face, you know, with yeah. that sacred money and it's changed your life and you're happier for it. And if you, if you notice what Travis said, he says, you're not emphasizing a dollar amount. Yeah. You're, you're identifying a purpose. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, is like, you know, I know I keep reverting back to talking to the, the, the business, but it's just because I'm passionate about it. Like okay. we've got this thing called inspiration engine. I'm glad you're talking about and it, it. Well, it's just That's like, you're here. you know, I talk about it because I know it'll make a difference Absolutely. for people. It's not because I want to make a billion dollars, nope. but it's like, look, if you don't if know, you do it's okay. Yeah. And you know, if it's long as it's for the right reasons, like 100%. I, I actually honestly believe that ha money should buy happiness sure. and it, because it gives you access to better healthcare, the work you want to do, vacations that matter. And, but like people just spend it on the stupidest things that don't matter. And it's just like, you know, anyway, I could go my soapbox forever, no. but, but the inspiration engine is super cool. It'll be our IP. It'll be the thing that differentiates us. Like we're, we're going to be the company that is the best at inspiring people to do things that will help them be happier, but better than anybody else. And so that inspiration engine is going to be so cool. So in summary, if people want to like find what you're doing, what this is all about, what are they looking for? Yeah. I mean, you can just go to work life. It's with the Y and that's on purpose. Cause it's like our North star, the Y of this. Okay. And so work life, uh, L Y F E dot I O. Um, there's not a lot out there yet. Cause we're in a private beta with like a, a handful of beta customers. Yeah, but if they want to follow you like on Instagram oh, yeah. or LinkedIn, like that, yeah. yeah, I'm not on I Facebook. See your, I see your stuff on yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah. I'm mostly on LinkedIn uh, right now. That's just kind of where I'm at right now. Business platform. Uh, business platform. So you can find me there and, uh, it's Travis Ashby. Yep. Like I said, high integrity guy. Appreciate you coming in, brother. Yeah, Great awesome. Yeah, thanks, up. Josh. Thanks a lot. Hey, as always, we appreciate you listening to the American Business Broker Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Lindsay. If any listeners are out there that want to buy or sell a business, please hit us up at AmericanBizBrokers.com or you can call me directly at 866-224-8386.